So th this morning I have a question for you. We all know that Noah's Ark was built as a three-story structure. And in fact, Dan and I were reminded of that yesterday. Um, Dan's aunt and uncle, Aunt Shelby and Uncle Art, had gone down to Cincinnati to celebrate their 15th anniversary and had gone to the Noah's Ark recreation that's down there. Some of you may know of that. And it indeed is three stories tall. They, they confirmed that for us yesterday. So we know that the top story has a window to let light in and to let the dove out at the end of the flood to see when the waters had receded. But my question for you is, how did the bottom two stories get light? Any ideas? Well, with floodlights, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. It was such a bad joke, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> so what in the world does that have to do with what we're going to talk about today? Well, you see my title, How the Light Gets In. We're going to learn it's not through floodlights, but at any rate. So today we are going to explore how the light gets into our world. And there are many, many heartwarming stories that inspire us to uh, do what we can to shine the light of compassion and generosity into our world. And the Angel of Queens is uh, one such story. Jorge Munez is one of the most inspiring people you'll, meet, you'll ever meet. He's a school bus driver by day and an angel by night. So as a school bus driver, Jorge makes about $700 a week driving a school bus, taking children to school. And then he turns around and spends about half of that money on food and beverages and packaging for the meals he makes for the needy. Now why does he do this? Well, according to Jorge, it's the right thing to do. So every night for the past five years, Jorge has, gone, has come home from work, rested about 10 minutes, drinks a cup of coffee, and then starts a second job. After the daily run to the grocery store, the food pantries, and churches to gather supplies, he and his family cook meals for about 150 needy people on his old stove in his apartment. He then goes to a corner in Queens, New York, and hands out home-cooked meals to those that are hungry. It is obvious that Jorge is able to see the needy differently than the rest of us do. He sees them as family. Jorge considers himself most lucky because he's surrounded by his family, his mother, his siblings, his nieces, nephews, aunts and uncles, cousins, and he wants the same for the needy, to feel that they have a family to support them. His reward for this display of compassion and generosity he says it's the smiles of appreciation on the faces of the men and the women as he gives them a home-cooked meal and the message that they matter. What an incredible way to let the light in. When we think about letting the light into our world, what soul traits come to your mind? I think immediately of compassion and generosity. These traits are not exclusive by any means, but they are the traits that I want to focus on with you this morning. I was surprised to realize that as a nation, we do recognize the importance of compassion and generosity in our culture. Every November 13th, we observe World Kindness Day. It is a holiday that is not well known, at least to me, and I can't help but feel that the world would be much brighter if this holiday were as popular as, it is, as, as Thanksgiving is. World Kindness Day is celebrated by sending cards and reminders to our loved ones, as many holidays are. But I would like to explore how we might be able to step it up a little bit. Specifically, how can we cultivate the soul traits of compassion and generosity to let light into our world? Perhaps surprisingly, the first step toward unconditional compassion is to develop compassion for ourselves. Pema Chodron, in her book entitled Start Where You Are, states that it is necessary to emphasize that the first step is to develop, is to develop compassion to, for our own wounds. It is unconditional compassion for ourselves that leads naturally to unconditional compassion for others. If we are willing to stand fully in our own shoes and never give up on ourselves, then we are able to put ourselves in the shoes of another and never give up on them. True compassion does not come from wanting to help out those who are less fortunate than ourselves, but from realizing our kinship with all beings. Jorge, the angel of queens, is a living demonstration of this truth to me. 
True and unconditional compassion for another is an inside-out job. It can only be born from true and unconditional compassion for ourselves. This is really no surprise when we stop to think about it. We're all familiar with Jesus' teaching on the greatest commandments. In the Gospel of Mark, we read, Now one of the experts in the law came to Jesus and asked, Which commandment is most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord our, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The expert in the law said to him, that is true, teacher. You are right when you say he is one, and there is no one besides him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered thoughtfully, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This conversation answers the question, I think, that burns in every single one of us. What is my purpose in life? The answer may be surprising. God is not interested in our achievements, or in how much money we make, or in how much power we amass. God is interested in our heart. Whenever we choose to act out of kindness, compassion, and love, we are aligned with our true purpose. The need is, we need to look, to look no further. Ram Dass says it this way, oneness is the source of love. Real love is the one celebrating itself as two. When we have unconditional compassion for ourselves, we give ourselves what Michael Beckwith calls a small box inoculation. Several years ago, Reverend Beckworth urged his congregation to do just this, explaining that we tend to put people into small boxes and we label them. Political labels, religious labels, lifestyle labels, etc. But when we practice self-compassion, we tend to see the commonalities between us instead of the differences. When we realize that we are one with all life and honor the God presence in everyone, we encounter it. Generosity is manifested. Generosity is the outward form of true compassion. Generosity is also one of the 13 Musar soul traits. The Musar practice is, the, uh, is of the Jewish tradition and is similar to the practice of meditation for the Buddhist. Um, it's similar to what we refer to as unfolding in the unity principles. The goal of this practice, by whatever name you call it, is to, allow, uh, is to allow us to fulfill our potential to live as the holy souls that we are. In other words, the goal of this practice is to let more light into our world. The generosity that I'm referring to does not come from a sense of obligation or from rational thought. And in the Hebrew language, there's a word, a special word, for this kind of generosity. Um, the word is uh, utanu, and it has a special meaning. It means you shall give away yourself, or yourselves, actually. This generosity is an outward manifestation of an irresistible feeling that stirs deep within every single one of us. It is a calling, a movement of the soul that erupts when you are pierced by the recognition of your direct connection to another soul. I was called to practice this Umtanu a few months ago, and I donated my kidney to Mike. Shortly after moving to our new downsized condo, Dan and I began to meet some of our new neighbors. And one such meeting was very, very unusual. I saw a strange sign on my neighbor Mike's car. In fact, Kai, our son, was the one who pointed it out to us. It said something like this, kidney needed, typo, share your spare. My first emotion upon reading that was, was sadness, profound sadness, because I realized that this person would probably die if he did not receive a kidney. Uh, when we would see Mike in passing, when we were walking to the store, walking around our neighborhood, our conversation was always about his progress on securing a kidney donor. And we learned that there were two possible donors for Mike, but that both had fallen through for various reasons. And like Jorge, the angel of Queens, I too was most appreciative of something that I had been given through no special merit of my own. I did nothing to deserve this. But I have a very good health, I've enjoyed that, and a very strong body. 
And I've come to view this good health as a very, very precious gift. And I've often been saddened to learn that not everyone is so wonderful, uh, wonderfully blessed. I also realize that the universe, in infinite wisdom, has given most of us a spare kidney. We truly need only one kidney to, need a, to lead a normal and healthy life. These were the seeds of my direct connection with another soul. It is not an ego or personality level attraction at all. My donation is what they call an altruistic donation because I really do not know Mike, except to greet him by name. In fact, we're not really drawn to be friends or even close acquaintances. The soul connection is at a much more primal level than that. I felt called to give because Mike's suffering became my suffering. This is true compassion, feeling as one with another, responding as freely for that other as you would for yourself. In my process, this realization was not an instantaneous realization at all. I knew that donating my kidney was something I was called to do for several weeks before I acted on it and shared it with anyone else. Why the delay, you might wonder? Well, as I stated before, true generosity is born of true and unconditional compassion. It doesn't come from an obligation to do something noble for someone else or from rational thought. It comes from an open heart. And how do we distinguish the prompting that comes from an open heart and not from the rational mind? But what I found in my own life is that it's a matter of persistence. There were two things that I needed to discern before making my intention known because I know my personality. I had to know that I was responding from an open heart, not from a noble desire to help someone else in need. And there is a huge, huge difference. If I was giving from a noble desire to help someone else in need, then I would be giving out of obligation. And when those second thoughts would come, as they did, absolutely, um, I would feel that the pressure to repress them and to proceed, because I had given my word that I was going to do this, and then I knew what would happen. I would become very resentful and very angry. So before, I can practice, so before we can practice true, true generosity, we must make sure that we know the source of our calling. True generosity is born from an open heart that is connected to another soul. This, by the way, is the natural state of our heart, open and giving. If our heart is open and generous by nature, then how does its flow get closed off? and obstructed. Well, there are two things that close our hearts. Our irrational fears, which most of us have an abundance of, and our own woundedness, which we also have an abundance of. Our irrational fears cause us to close our hearts in order to protect ourselves. So say we connect with another soul in need. Perhaps it's a needy person who's begging at a stoplight that's taken your attention. We, um, we do not give because we fear lack. We tell ourselves stories like, if I gave to every beggar I meet, well, then I won't have enough money for myself and my loved ones for whom I'm responsible. And this is a legitimate concern, but it should not stop our giving. Instead of giving money every time you encounter a beggar, perhaps we need to give what we need to give is a meal, like Jorge does, joining with others to provide food for those who are in need. Another thing that can close our heart and stop its natural flow of generosity is our own woundedness. This is why true and unconditional path, path, uh, compassion must precede the act of, uh, practice of true generosity. We must practice acceptance and unconditional love of ourselves first. We must be willing and able to stand fully in our own shoes, loving every aspect of ourselves, even those that aren't so shiny and lovable. We must love every aspect of ourselves unconditionally, never giving up on ourselves. Only when we have fully embraced ourselves can we put ourselves in the shoes of another and fully embrace them. One of the surprising things that I learned about compassion and generosity during my donation journey is that our offerings are not always pretty. In fact, they're really never pretty. They are earthy, they're organic, and actually they're as full of woundedness as we are. One of my favorite writers, Leonard Cohen, captures this truth eloquently in his song entitled Anthem. The course of that song goes something like this. Ring the bells that still can ring. 
forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I found enormous comfort in this song as I was recovering from my donation surgery, especially while enduring some of the unexpected uh, complications in my journey to restoring health. I had to return to the hospital a couple of times during recovery to deal with some very severe dehydration. And I was angry and I was resentful. I was jealous that the recipient was doing, uh, experiencing much better health than I was, and I thought that was very unfair. I was angry that the doctors would not listen to me, that they seemed to ignore my pleas for help. I was resentful that I had paid such a price to do what I thought was the right thing to do, and this was the thanks I received for my generosity. Leonard Cohen helped me to understand that these cracks in our offerings are part of the gift. <coughs> I can't help but recall the well-known icon of compassion and generosity, Mother Teresa. She was a nun and a missionary, and she is known in the Catholic Church as St. Teresa of Calcutta. She devoted her life to caring for the sick and the poor. Born in Macedonia to parents of Albanian descent, and having taught in India for 17 years, Mother Teresa explained her call, in, for, uh, experienced her call in 1946. Her order established a hospice, centers for the blind, aged, and disabled, and a leper colony. In 1979, Mother Teresa received the Nobel Peace Prize for her, her humanitarian work. She died in 1997 and was beatified in October 2003. In December 2015, Pope Francis recognized a second miracle attributed to Mother Teresa, clearing the way for her to be canonized on September 4th, 2016. Despite all of this widespread praise, Mother Teresa's life and work have not gone without controversies. In 2003, the publication of Mother Teresa's private correspondence caused a wholesale reevaluation of her life by revealing the crisis of faith she suffered for most of the last 50 years of her life. In one despairing letter a confident, to a confidant, she wrote, where is my faith? Even deep down, there is nothing nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful this unknown pain. I have no faith. I dare not utter, utter the words and thoughts that crowd my heart and make me suffer untold agony. But this is to be expected. No offering is perfect because we are human, and this is no accident. The cracks in our offerings are what let the light in. So while such revelations are shocking, considering Mother Teresa's public image, they have also made Mother Teresa a more relatable and human figure to all of us who experience doubt in our beliefs, allowing the light to pour in and to light our way when we need it. Compassion that blossoms into generosity is paradoxical. True generosity impacts the giver as much as it does the recipient. Notice that the Hebrew word for utanu is, I don't know if you can all see this, try to make as large as I could, is actually what we call a palindrome. If we read it left to right, which is the way it's meant to be read, we see that we have vav, nun, te, nun, vav, which reads the same way if we go right to left. And I believe that this is no mistake. Um, we know that the universe supports a vacuum. So when a temporary emptiness is created, when we give ourselves away, the universe rushes in to fill it. I found this to be true in my practice of generosity. The first act of generosity I received in donating my kidney was a clean bill of health. When you donate an organ to someone, you must undergo a thorough health screening. There can be no potential life-threatening conditions present like uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes. There can be no cancers present either since you're giving one of your organs and all that it contains to another human being. So at no expense to me, I was given every test you can imagine and probably some you can't even imagine, at least I couldn't even imagine when I started this journey, and uh, to ensure that I was in excellent health myself. I also had the opportunity to realize that I had been abundantly blessed with many, many gifts that I took for granted. I, had a, I have a steady job that not only provided me time off with full pay, but since Columbus State Community College is part of the Ohio uh, donation program, all that time that I missed for my recovery and my surgery 
did not come from the abundant amount of sick leave that I built up over the last 30 years because I have such a good and healthy and strong body. And none of it came from that. It was all taken from the state. Um, I'm also blessed with a loving and supportive family and um, very, very close friends. In fact, some of you were part of that part of my journey. I know that Joanne shared with you what I was doing and I received your cards and I, I felt your prayers during that time. And even during the darkest times of my recovery, which did not go as smoothly as predicted, I felt your unfailing support, the support of my, um, my loved ones and my family. But the most incredible gift came when I had to return to the hospital for the second time after my donation surgery because I was, again, severely dehydrated. While testing for a blockage in my intestines, which the doctors theorized might be the source of my dehydration, they discovered a tumor on my stomach that had been misidentified during the screening tests that I had a few months earlier. As a result, I was ordered to go through more testing, and as a result of that, I discovered that I had stomach cancer. So another crack in my offering, and more light led into my consciousness. I firmly believe that we do not cause our illnesses in any way. Our illnesses visit us just as various emotions and desires and intentions visit us. And that illness is just an invitation to learn to love yourself more. When I met with a surgical oncologist, I was told something that I never ever realized. I had a good cancer. Now to me, that is an oxymoron if there ever was one. <laughs> Aren't all cancers bad? Don't we fear the big C, the big cancer word? But this type of cancer that I had, it's not usually malignant. And because it was discovered at such an early stage, it had not yet metastasized to any other organs in my body. Part of the reason for this very favorable diagnosis was the size of the tumor, which was very, very small, just about two centimeters. Cancers like the one that I had um, are not usually caught in the early stages because they present no symptoms. And um, so they go on and on for years until they finally get large enough that they do present symptoms. So the tumor was removed. And the surgery that, that I had to remove it was not nearly as major as my donation surgery, so it was like you know, a piece of cake after that trip. And um, because of the stage of the cancer, stage zero, no further radiation or treatment was needed, and I'm now cancer-free. The doctor tells me that the type of cancer that I have is not known to recur and will not affect the recipient of my kidney in any way. And hence the paradox of generosity. Had I not donated my kidney, I would have never known of my stomach cancer until possibly much, much later in life when symptoms started to appear. And I can't help but wonder if the diagnosis at that time would have been as favorable as the one that I received a few months ago. So as I reflect back on my journey of donation, I realize that our life's work is to learn to love ourselves more deeply. We know that every situation and every person in our life is perfect, as they are, perfect, whole, and complete. And each one is an invitation to let more light into our world by giving, them, giving us the opportunity to learn to love ourselves more completely. True generosity is born of this unconditional compassion for self and is absolutely reciprocal. Both the giver and the recipient are equally blessed. True generosity is the natural state of our heart when we are aligned with our true purpose to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we see it all around us every single day if we just open our eyes. In fact, just this past Friday, I was meeting with some colleagues to prepare for a presentation that we're giving next weekend. And Karen, one of the people that I'm presenting with, I, I got a call from her as I was pulling out of my driveway to go to our meeting. And she said, Liz, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. And she told me the story of what was unfolding for her. She had gone to the tennis court, as she always does on Friday. She's a tennis instructor and an avid tennis player. And while she was playing on the court, on another court on the other side of the gym, one of the tennis players had fallen down. Um, he'd suffered a major heart attack. And uh, his teacher started calling, is there anyone, is there anyone who knows CPR? Well, my friend Karen, without hesitation, gave away herself to save the life of a fallen tennis player. She performed CPR for 10 to 15 minutes before the first responders were, were, first responders were able to arrive on the scene. Then after that, she went and she uh, went to the schools and picked up the man's children to take to the hospital to be with, with their mother during this time. 
And um, so it, it's just around us, just the way we live our lives, if we live them from our open heart, which is our natural state. And the reward we reap for practicing unconditional compassion and true generosity is the very presence of God dwelling among us, letting light into the world. This is the affirmation that I would like to leave you with this morning. I surrender to the perfection of life. Would you say that with me? I surrender to the perfection of life.